This course is a course on organization management and uh, organization management is the centerpiece of all management action. Whether you are dealing with uh, concerns of finance, marketing, production or manufacturing, every function needs to be organized. Therefore, so far as the nature of the subject matter is concerned, as uh, is said in Gita, Swalpamasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat. Even a little bit of this dharma, and dharma here is not a religion. Dharma is a way of life. Dharma means duty. Trayate mahato bhayat dispels huge doubts. So, if you do not understand what is management, if you do not understand what is the nature of management, decision making, problem solving, then understand how organizations work, the rest of the understanding of management will fall in place. While introducing the subject matter or introducing the course, First and foremost, it is necessary for you to understand its significance and believe in its significance before you start understanding its significance. Because one listens with one's mind and this is again a core concept of Indian tradition. The Indian ethos believes that learning takes place through the mind. The other support systems of the year the sight and other senses are roots to learning. The registering of learning is through mana. There is no literal translation of the word mana into English, but the closest one comes to is the use of the word mind, it is cognition. And therefore, the central concept of learning is cognition. Cognition is determination of management. You are not a manager when you sit there directing others to work. Therefore, decision making and problem solving with resource optimization is the only functional definition of management. To do that, you need to organize. And to organize requires ability. And uh, that ability has to be developed. This course on organization management will presumably help you in developing that ability. Therefore, it is a practitioner's text. You need to be conscious of the fact that management is a craft. It is neither a science not an art, nor an art. It is both. And both of them put together in an applied manner help you to do certain things better. So, you are not a manager unless you are able to practice that craft. And like any other craft, management craft has to be learnt. It is not even sector specific. Everything needs management. Your wardrobe needs management. Your papers need management. Your cooking needs management. In fact, management is as old as human civilization. There is a popular notion that management originated in the West. It did not. The current practice of management as we teach it through the MBA curriculum indeed is rooted in the West. Because that was a response to the post World War phenomena around the 1920s. I was talking of the first world war. It needs to be understood that faster modes of production came in with the industrial revolution, which go back to the late 18th century. But then again, the knowledgeable know that there is a there has not been just one industrial revolution in this on this planet. 
There have been several industrial revolutions in the course of human civilization in different parts of the globe. And a lot of those industrial revolutions were far ahead of the achievements of the current industrial revolution. For example, the iron pillar near Kutub has rust-proof iron, something which even the present day metallurgists haven't been able to discover. So it is not as if science and technology is an exclusive preserve of the modern world. The difference therefore between the industrial revolution as we see it today and industrial revolution as was there in the past is that this is a continuing industrial revolution. It hasn't stopped yet. Whereas the previous industrial revolutions have had a break. And just as there has been civilization break, there was the Roman civilization, it died. There was the Greek civilization, it died. There was the Egyptian civilization, it died. So it's not as if they hadn't achieved heights of civilization, but those civilizations were born, they grew, and they met their death, which is the normal process of any organismic phenomena. The same thing happened with industrial revolution. The current one with which we are enveloped was a continuing industrial revolution, is a continuing industrial revolution, which is what makes it significant. Management is an outcome of that kind of industrial revolution. That is why a lot of the concepts of management have begun in the industry and have subsequently been applied in the other domains, like agriculture, like services. But manufacturing was the first place where management was practiced. So much to let you understand that you should be conscious of the fact that the act of management is as old as human civilization. And texts of management are available in different types of traditional literature which have achieved greater sophistication in thought than many of the modern texts. Take for example, Chanakya's text. Arthashastra. Arthashastra essentially means the science of money or the science of economics. And Arthashastra propounded the birth of the civil society far more clearly than was what was subsequently propounded by the social contractualists Hobb, Locke and Rousseau. Only we do not know of it because we do not know the root language in which all this knowledge is stored. An Arthashastra says, Matsya Nyaya Bhibhuta Prajanam Manum Rajam Prachakrire which essentially means caught under the law of fishes, the subjects declared Manu to be their king. What is the law of fishes? The law of fishes is the larger fish eat the smaller fish. Matsya Nyaya, Matsya means fish, Nyaya means logic. Under the logic of the fishes, oppressed by it, the people declared Manu to be their king and thereby was born the civil society. And that is the first scholastic propounding of the social contract theory. So, social contract theory did not begin during the medieval period, during the 14th, 15th, 16th century as is taught in political science classes. Social contract theory began at least in its known form 300 years before the birth of Christ. And management in its form began then because the formation of the civil society is the first major step in the practice of management. It is only when a civil society is born that you can manage optimally. And that is the nature of the subject. And it is important for you to be tuned into this 
so that you understand the other detailed discussions on the topics which you will be undertaking with clarity and see where you come in. It is also important for you to realize that uh, the nature of the subject requires, as I have said more than once, decision making and problem solving with resource optimization. And therefore, you have to organize. There is the act of organizing. Be it supply chain management, be it input, throughput, output theory, be it physical systems theory, be it the general systems theory, whatever it is. One has to look at the input, the throughput and the output. And it is this flow of controlled, gradual organizing of activities that leads to value addition and therefore an outcome. All management action therefore is rooted in the result of value addition and outcome. For those of you who may not be familiar with systems thought, let me share with you a very simple concept. The concept of mass energy conversion in the throughput process. Value addition takes place through the mass energy conversion process. And it is important for you to recognize that the sum total of mass and energy is constant in the universe. This was said in Gita several millennia ago and it was written off as the shepherd's tale. We had to wait till Einstein restated it to start believing it. I do not want to shed any tears on the kind of intellectual slavery many people suffer from in not believing anything which is rooted in their own tradition but only believing something which originates in a prestigious learning center elsewhere. God bless them. I have no quarrels with anyone or anything. But surely, civilization in its known form has survived in many river valleys across this planet in a very evolved manner. But that is another story. What you have got to understand is the business of organizing has various traditions. We will not have time in this course to visit the different traditions of organizing. We will however be looking at the process of organizing and how it is done. It is that which takes me to what could be captioned as the introduction to organization management, its nature, scope and if I might add complexity. Let us be clear about the nature of organizations. And you find here that I have said that organizations are all per pervasive. You heard me argue that organizations are central to civil society. And the first organized form of a civil society is the family. Family is a concept leads to an identifiable father and of course an identifiable mother. And when you will get into the psychological dimension of a growth of a human being, you will find that it is not just a biological father and it is not just a biological mother which goes into the personality makeup of a child, but there are traits which want of a better phrase are labeled male traits or are labeled feminine traits. You could have used any other name. Because it is about time a post female eunuch generation if you know the name of that book and you should because it caused a major revolution in the understanding of gender relationships. 
that basically there is nothing which is essentially male or essentially female. What marks a difference is a simple biological function. The rest of the distinctive characteristics are a factor of social conditioning, cultural norms, the pattern of rearing and the kind of society one lives in. All the other manifestations can be done away with. Therefore, the label masculine and feminine is the caption of a set of traits. Indeed, all women have characteristics which are, which are labeled as the masculine variety and all men also have characteristics which are listed under the feminine variety. It is the respective ratio which creates a male or a female. Therefore, the proposition to you is simple. Organizations are not a post-industrial phenomena. And as you would have registered, organizations are central to civilization itself. And the cornerstone of a civilization is the family. And that remains so even today, in spite of all the experiments which have been done on the kind of family structures which exist, with the kind of gender relationships which can exist, and indeed the kind of society which we are talking about. But we should stay clearly focused on what we are here to talk about, what is meant by the nature of organizations. And I am proposing to you that organizations are all per se pervasive. Family is the first organization. The place of work is another organization. What is a place of work? Place of work is any place where a task gets done in the interest of value addition, in the interest of productivity, in the interest of production of goods and all civil societies need it. If nothing else, they need a place of work to create tools. They need a place of work to create instruments of defense, they need a place of work where they can create items which can be used to cover themselves up with and this can be made of different kinds of material. So, organizations are all pervasive first either as the family and the second as place of work. Organizations are required as needs cannot be just satisfied by individuals because there are needs for goods and services. And that again creates a social structure. So, first you have the cornerstone of a society, then you have means of sustaining the society and then as the society grows there is a social structure. The social structure definitionally creates a division of labor. Division of labor by all accounts will create its own specialization. Its own specialization will lead to a perpetuation. because skill is passed on from one generation to another and it is in this that the caste system was born. If you go back to the ancient texts, for example, Manu Smriti, which talks of the caste structure, it was not what we define caste to be today. Caste was by worth and not by birth. 
And if you want to understand that, all you have got to recognize is that there can be several pursuits of different professions amongst say a group of five or six brothers in the same family. One could be a priest, one could be a warrior, one could be a simple person dealing with trade and commerce and they were all of the same family. This convoluted concept of caste is an attributed sociological phenomena which has today acquired all types of political forms. One of the advantages of understanding how management was practiced is the need to understand the social structure. And mind you, this kind of division was not exclusive to India. It was there in ancient Greece, it was there in ancient Rome, it was there in China. The warrior class was there everywhere. And you took pride over the achievements of the family in that profession. Even today in India, you find families who call themselves railwaymen. We have been a family of railwaymen and they take a lot of pride in being family of railwaymen. We are a family of civil servants. My great grandfather, people will claim, was a member of the colonial civil service worked in Sri Lanka. My grandfather was a civil servant. My father was a civil servant. I am a civil servant. That does not make it a caste. Therefore, understanding of social structures is critical to the understanding of how society handles its productive processes. And the nature of organizations deal with these issues of allocation of tasks, capability development, transference of learning, training and development, but we shall see more of that as we go along. The organizations as needs cannot be satisfied by individuals, satisfy those needs. And therefore, you need an organization for goods and services and you need an organization for the sociological needs. When you organize, there will be a hierarchy. Hierarchy is both by designation and by brand. Which is why certain families, surnames have become a brand. Which is why a name becomes a brand. Because ultimately all organizations require some kind of a decision making structure and you will find through the course the word structure will reappear over and over again. Because structure is the concept which defines the relationship amongst the constituent units. Once you create a structure, there will be an exercise of power in the best sense of the word. Human beings are born equal and that is a statement which has gone around many times and rightly so. Human beings are born equal so far as the dignity of a human being is concerned and human beings are born equal so far as career open to talent is concerned. There has to be a certain process through which the functioning 
of the society will have to recognize that you have to organize constructively and not everyone can decide over everything. So, ultimately the ability to exercise power also becomes an effort in creating live structures and power the use of which determines the nature of the constituent units of the organization structure, determines the nature of the input, determines the nature of the output and determines the nature of the functioning of the system. And therefore, ultimately the exercise of power itself becomes a specialization. There are two other concepts besides power which I would like you to note and we shall come back to this later on in the course to explain. The two additional concepts are authority and influence. What is the difference between structure, power and authority? We will come to later. As of now, I want to focus exclusively on what is the role of organization structure in running an organization. The first and foremost role which organization structure plays in running an organization is that it helps to put together people for the achievement of a given objective and that is the definition of an organization. Organization is a group of people brought together to fulfill a given objective. That is the difference between an organization and a mob. Therefore, basically organization management is an essay in systematic conduct of human affairs. If the objectives are achieved, the organization is considered to be effective. But for the objectives to be achieved, jobs have to be well defined. Information flow has to be smooth and coordination and control has to be intelligently and effectively handled. As you can well imagine, I am already on to explaining to you the scope of organization management. <coughs> when you talk of organization management, you are basically talking of achieving the objectives, defining the jobs, ensuring information flow, coordination. which will require control and ultimately it has to be an employees organization. Please note people are essential to an organization. You cannot have an organization without people. So, the scope covers all these things and it becomes progressively clear as you progress in the course. What are therefore the characteristics of an organization? It has a specific purpose which can be both documented or verbal. An organization will have members, it will have hierarchies of authority and accountability. You cannot have authority without accountability. 
and progressively the concepts become more refined, the concepts become more defined, the con concepts become more rarefied and that is the scope of research in organization management, but another story. But you, you will recall that I began this session by reminding you that this is the core of decision making with resource optimization and it applies to all functions. In fact, it is my case that one of the biggest causative factors of the kind of meltdown which one noticed about a year ago, which mind you is still not a thing of the past, was essentially because the finance sector is very badly organized. The correlations between policy making, regulating, the capital market, the intermediary institutions, the retail outlets are not even talked about, let alone be understood. And this notion that the more you split it in decimal points, the greater is the sophistication of analysis was one of the major causative factors of the kind of meltdown which people saw. Be it the securities market, be it the capital market, and you heard me say, we have not heard the last of it. And I consider this a very important concept to show to you when ignored, what does it cause? Progressively the realization is going, getting around that for proper financial systems, you need formal organizations which are linked with each other which coordinate with each other and go back to what I was telling you earlier on, where the jobs are well defined, where the information is well lubricated and it flows gently from one sector to another. You can't say this is a capital market institution, this is an intermediary institution, this is a retail activity. If you run it as isolated silos, then be prepared for more of what you have seen. It Operate at same state at all times, strategy is required if moving from chaotic condition to healthy conditions. Organization is therefore a movement from chaotic conditions to conditions which I have termed here healthy for want of a better word. It is part of the macro environment consisting of a society, competitors, vendors, financial institutions and it has a value system. Every organization has its own value. Every organization has its own method of work. Every organization system has its own organizational practices. And therefore, those who get into organization management must be trained first and most of all in the act of observation. Because when you join an organization new, it will be a rare situation if somebody walks up to you and introduces the organization to you into how it really works. Most organizations in terms of their power exercise in terms of the real nature of networks, in terms of the real flow of work methods are like an iceberg. Most of it is unknown and what is known is only a tip. And this is not put out in handouts. It is also to be understood that ultimately this will have to be mapped and put in a structural form which can be identified. 
if you can't identify it, it's not there. But then it will be an impossible story if you are able to identify everything. The dimensions of an organization, therefore, are structural, processes, behavioral. And we will be spending adequate time on all these three aspects. because that is what the course consists of. Let us look at the analogy between a human body and an organization. The human body is again an excellent example of an organized system. And if you are at all familiar with human anatomy, you would be aware that there is the brain, there is the heart, there are the lungs, there are the intestinal systems, there are the lower limbs, which <coughs> consist of bones, muscles, blood vessels, central nervous systems which transmit messages and of course this is not the place for me to teach you human physiology. But then presumably those of you who are literate would be aware that there is such a thing as understanding the human body. If you are to lead a full life as an individual and if there is such a thing as understanding the human body to lead the full life of, life of an individual then I would like to use the example of a human body to help you to understand the complexity of an organization. You notice projected on the screen a correlation which draws an analogy of the organization with the human body. There is a structure which goes with the anatomy. There are processes which go with physiology. And there are behaviors which go with psychology. I am trying to walk you through different components of understanding organization structure, organization processes, the behavioral components. Because if you go back to the previous diagram, I was telling you that these are the different dimensions of the organization. Therefore, in the ultimate analysis, this should give you uh, an idea of the complexity of an organization and therefore what it takes to manage an organization. There are structure related issues. It must have the right hierarchy. It should have a span of control, designing of the line and staff function, nature of management information systems work methods, job definition, performance appraisal methods. In fact, these are the, this is the range of organization management. And this is how organization management works. That is then converted into the scalar principle. There is the top level, there is the middle level and there is the lower level. In fact, if you look at it, a 
it is the top level, the middle level and the lower level that constitutes the organizational pyramid. and that constitutes the organizational hierarchy. We will have occasion to come back to more of this as we go along. The important thing for you to understand is that uh, we will have to recognize the complexity of organization management in a manner which helps us to understand how life actually flows. I shall stop the session there and revert back to this in the next session. Thank you very much.